Hi everyone. First, just a big thanks to James, Jen, and Jen for organizing the Sustainable UX Conference. It's great to have this opportunity to talk to you today. I just wanted to start by giving you a quick idea of my perspective, which is coming from a background in psychology and community engagement and interests in behavior and in environmental and public health issues. So I've spent a lot of my career working on human environment relations in one way or another. I spent a lot of that time trying to convince people on the environmental side of things to be more human centered. And then with the growth of human centered design, I find myself now talking more and more about finding some sort of balance between human centeredness and nature centeredness. And I'm also really interested in how design influences behavior. One thing that's clear is that how we use things, and by that I mean everything, including products and buildings and cities, how we use things influences resource use. But unfortunately, our actions are more and more separated from the impacts of those actions. So it's important, especially as designers, to look at context and design and how it influences behavior and environmental impacts. Which brings me to digital and physical contexts. So today I want to talk about the connections and a perceived divide between digital and physical worlds. Because getting this physical digital connection right is so important for our future and for environmental sustainability. So for a long time we've struggled with a perceived divide between humans and nature where we've seen ourselves as separate from nature. And that's at the root of a lot of our environmental problems. And now we have a physical digital divide where we work very separately in digital and in physical environments. And we often don't connect the impacts of our digital work and behaviors on the physical world. And this is only going to exacerbate our environmental problems. So first, I'm starting with the premise that we need to think about the relationship between digital and physical, and that separateness, in general, tends to have negative implications for environmental sustainability. And then with the idea that digital designers have a powerful and growing influence over how we interact with our physical world. And then I'm asking how digital UX then can influence our interactions with the physical world for positive impacts on our environment and ultimately on our health. And I'm specifically talking about behavior and its implications with the idea that what your users do in the physical world is based in part on their experience with your digital product. And I want to stop here and just make the point to not think in terms of just green products or sustainable behavior, because all behavior, all products, all choices have an impact, whether intended or not, right? So everything is connected. And you'll hear the word systems a lot as I talk, and that's a big part of what I want to bring to the discussion. So for designers, it's thinking about what that impact might be without necessarily categorizing it as green or sustainable. So my aims today are to make the case for context so that when we think about users and experiences and behavior and environmental impacts, we're thinking in terms of systems. To look more closely at the physical digital divide and ultimately what I want to do is to get us all thinking about how we can bridge this divide and bring our best methods and thinking to bear for environmentally sustainable solutions. So I want to get to context and behavior and complex systems, but in trying to understand something, it's often helpful to see it in relation to other concepts. So really briefly, in the next couple of slides, I'm going to give an overview of various models for studying human behavior and the basis then for interventions to change behavior. This is going to be a very simplified, quick look. The first perspective here is the rational one, that we each weigh the costs and benefits of things and then make a reasoned judgment. A lot of the focus here is on price. Another perspective is the social dilemma model. You see this a lot with things like overfishing. So how do we get people to change their behavior 
when the individual and collective interests don't align, at least in the short term. Then there are behavioral models and the idea that we can condition people to behave in certain ways, particularly with things like rewards. Most recently, a lot of attention has been on decision-making models and behavioral economics with the idea that we engage in two types of thinking, a slow, deliberate type and a quick cognitive energy-saving type that relies on shortcuts. Interventions then take these shortcuts into account to influence behavior. And then a lot of environmental research has fallen into this next category with a focus on values, attitudes, beliefs, norms, and motivation. The emphasis here is often on changing minds using education and other means and on social influence. Some of these models account for context beyond the social context, but it's generally underemphasized. We run into some common problems with trying to influence people's behavior. One major issue is the gap between what we think or believe and what we do, or even between what we intend to do and what we do. So even when we're successful at changing minds, that doesn't necessarily mean behavior follows. One of the reasons for this gap is that a lot of what we do is routine. It's unconscious and it's shaped by our environment, and it's really difficult to overcome habits. And then there are the limits to what people can actually do, what they have control over. And if you've ever played around with an environmental footprint calculator, you probably know that a lot of our personal impact is essentially built into the system. So when we make one choice, which might not seem to be environmental, there are all kinds of environmental implications. And I say this to highlight the power of design and the importance of systems. So environmental psychology provides a little bit different view that emphasizes context and environment. Environment here meaning the person's environment, not necessarily nature. And the idea here is that behavior is often driven by factors outside of the individual, including the social environment and norms, but also the physical environment, and that the relationships among those factors and the person is what we're interested in. And one really major implication here is that design influences behavior. So we can think about that for a minute in, in an extreme example. This is a lockout tagout device. It's used in situations where the stakes are really high. So when we want to make sure that someone isn't electrocuted or injured by machinery being turned on while they're working on it, in this kind of situation, we don't rely on interventions that focus on changing minds. We very forcibly guide behavior. And you can think about this type of strategy on a much bigger scale. Obviously, we can't do this with everything. But it gives you a sense of using design to influence behavior or building a behavior in with design, in this case, in the physical environment, or at least designing to support a particular behavior. With environmental psychology, one of the tools that we use is the bioecological model, which is a way of conceptualizing the complex system that we all live in. And it's really helpful in thinking about influencing behavior. Essentially, the bioecological model is a simple systems model, and what's important here is the idea that things are connected and have multiple influences. And then the best solutions for complex problems likely are going to address things at more than one level. And just to give you an idea of what's in this system, the individual is at the center. That includes everything like our personal attitudes and beliefs and characteristics. And then we go out to the people and the products that we interact with and where we live and work and then the larger societal forces and culture. And the great thing about a systems view is it doesn't preclude any particular solution, but it does let you locate where your solution is and how it might complement or work with other solutions. And very importantly, it keeps context top of mind. So you can focus on the individual, but it's always in relation to their environment. And thinking in this way also gives you space to think about products and think about design. So what we know from decades of research related to sustainable behavior and why a systems model is so important, and this is a fundamental point that can't be stressed too much, is that context can often override personal variables. 
So we know that changing minds doesn't necessarily work to change outcomes. And that's because of the gap that we talked about. And also, again, that a lot of environmental impacts are built in or that the more impactful option is by far the easier thing to do. So we need to design a system that supports everyone's behavior sustainably. Given that, it's important to continue to question context and how it drives behavior and environmental impacts, and then to consider whether there's a solution to be had in changing the environment somehow. So if you're concerned with context and the interaction between people and their environments, and you think in terms of systems, you quickly run into a problem when talking about influencing behavior and environmental impacts today. And that's that we live in both digital and physical worlds, but we treat digital and physical worlds very differently and separately, which makes it difficult to address sustainability because we aren't looking at the whole system. One of the things that really got me thinking about this was conversations I've had over the last few months with people who work in physical design and people who work in digital design. There are a lot of parallels between the two types of work and both are dealing with human behavior and both have implications for our environment. But the norm in each is to sort of stop at this imaginary boundary between digital and physical. And this is where I think UX can help because there's a focus here on experience. And we know that human experience often blends the digital and the physical. So there's a huge opportunity here for people who think in terms of human experience. Now, if you ask what digital tools are out there to help people behave more sustainably, the answer is that there are a variety of digital solutions that were designed to directly and intentionally connect with and have a positive environmental impact on the physical world. So we have solutions that help people make purchasing decisions that have less impact. And then beyond purchasing, things that help people make better day-to-day -day choices and plan ahead for actions they take less often, like recycling electronics. Solutions that save resources related to travel or help people save energy. And solutions that contribute to public and environmental health by encouraging people to track wildlife or report spills and other problems. In each case here, these are solutions that have a direct connection to a specific action in the physical world, which is great. Just to give you a couple of examples, this is Good Guide, which supports purchasing decisions. So you can look up specific products or look at products within a particular category, and then you can learn about the environmental and other impacts of those products, and you can make comparisons. And this is eBird, an identification tool and a citizen science tool. So it not only encourages people to go outside and engage with nature, but it also provides data for scientists who are doing research on bird populations. And something that might be a little less familiar, drug disposal. So leftover drugs present both an environmental hazard and a public health problem. And one solution is to have people dispose of drugs in a safe place. So this is just one of several digital tools that simply help people locate a safe disposal site. So we asked, what digital tools out there help people behave more sustainably? And right now, that's where a lot of the thinking is. How can we use digital tools to support environmental behavior? And so we see the digital piece as a tool to address a problem in the physical world. And the challenge then becomes, you have to capture people's interest and attention, which isn't easy. And then you have to convert that to action using the tool. And there are a lot of good things out there that support environmental behavior among people who are motivated to seek them out. But really we need to be thinking bigger in the sense of impacts and systems and smaller in the sense of every little thing that we do. So how can we create solutions within everything we do, solutions that encompass a broader audience, including those who aren't necessarily seeking out environmental actions, but whose actions do have an impact, and how can we create more integrated solutions? So let's shift to thinking about action. With the diversity of UX and people working on so many different applications, there are lots of opportunities. 
So just thinking generally here about what can be done, you can start by asking, how does this experience drive resource use? And think especially about unintended consequences. And one of the things that's particularly relevant to digital experience is asking, what does this make easy? So for example, if you think about how easy it is to order something, in some situations, it's easy enough to place multiple orders separately in the span of a few minutes, which are then shipped separately in separate packages with separate paper invoices and separate packaging inside. So there are real world resource impacts stemming from a digital experience that was designed to be easy in a certain way. Or how easy is it to turn on the lights when you're not in a room or you're not even at home or to turn them on at the same time every day regardless of your schedule? And then what are the unintended consequences of that in terms of energy use? And how might we design this experience in a little bit different way to address those unintended consequences? Another way to look for opportunities to is to think about users and to push the idea of users out a bit. So to include people that your direct user interacts with or the people who deliver the product your user orders, for example, or the people your user manages. Thinking about the experiences and behaviors of those people and the associated environmental impacts. And then can we push out further in a way that makes it easier to identify environmental impacts one thought is to create a persona for Earth, or maybe one that's more local or specific. So really thinking about how is the planet accounted for in the design process? How could environmental impacts be accounted for in a participatory design process? And what we know from green building design is that the most successful environmental strategies are integrated in the process at the very beginning. They're not the ones that are added on at the end as a question or as an attempt to mitigate the impacts that have been designed in. So how can we find a way to integrate thinking about the environment in existing UX processes so that it is really built in? Another thing to think about is pushing for continuity beyond digital platforms. So if you're mapping out an experience and thinking about where it begins for different people and what steps they go through, it's thinking about the bounds of that activity. So what do you include? And thinking about how some of those steps might take place outside the digital space. Mapping out those connections might reveal unintended consequences or opportunities. So it's really all about pushing out a little bit beyond where the process is now. And it's not about going out and building a green app. So it's remembering that everything has some sort of impact and tapping into what you're already doing and what your users are already doing. So how can you set people up for success in terms of environmental impacts and what they're doing? And then finally, knowing that those lines between digital and physical will continue to blur, it's thinking about how you can be one of those people to build bridges to work across boundaries. And this is a, a fascinating case of the blurring of physical and digital environments and why it'll make more and more sense to think in terms of systems. This is Keith Green's work on human machine collaborative environments. So he's thinking in terms of integration of the digital and physical. He's asking things like, instead of a computer in a room, instead of thinking in, in terms of that, how can machines be designed and integrated into our environment to help us? And what he's creating are these responsive environments that support people's work and learning and accessibility and creativity in all kinds of ways. And he's talking about designing the technology and the physical environment together. So the separation is less and less prominent. So if you're thinking right now that you work in digital or you work in physical product design, and you're comfortable with a clear boundary, consider what that might actually look like in 10 years or in 20 years and what you can do now. So I just wanna end by saying that whatever you can do to bridge the physical digital divide and think in terms of systems, 
will ultimately be in the service of environmental sustainability. And in the more immediate term, bringing in some simple tools that might help you identify unintended consequences or understand environmental impacts better, or by looking at a broader experience or a broader set of users, that that might bring to light opportunities to reduce impacts. I really believe that the perspective UX designers have on human behavior and experience represents a tremendous opportunity to contribute to sustainable solutions. So thank you and please do reach out. I would love to talk to people about these topics.